1 Samuel chapter 1, it is Mother's Day. Again, happy Mother's Day to you. We're going to be looking at a godly woman in Scripture, the woman Hannah and her story. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let me give you some context before we get into the reading of God's Word. Just quickly, an introduction to the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel was the last judge in the period of the judges. The Bible says at this time that there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Samuel was the first of a new line of prophets, and he was anointed and appointed by God to anoint and appoint kings. And he appointed, of course, Saul, and then he appointed David after. Samuel ultimately would have the responsibility of calling the people of God to return to worship of the one God true God. And he is the link, Samuel is the link between the period of the judges and the kingship or the monarchy of Israel. One Bible commentator said this, Warren Wearsby I believe said this, at a time when the ages were colliding and everything seemed to be shaking, Samuel gave spiritual leadership to the nation of Israel and helped to move them toward national unification and spiritual rededication. Man, that is what we need in our country, amen? We need leaders who will guide us and lead us back to the Lord. This was Samuel's job. This is what 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2 is in partly about because it is the account of Samuel's birth. In order for Samuel to be this person, to be God's prophet, to be God's person who would lead the nation back into spiritual revival, he first had to be born. And this is the account as told in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's the record of God's divine hand in bringing about his divine will. And he does so through a godly woman named Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we have quite a bit to read. So I invite you to read silently as I read aloud. But I want to make sure we're honoring the word of God. So I'm going to invite you to stand. It'll keep you awake too as we read 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. 1 Samuel chapter 1, if you're excited about hearing from the Word of God, would you say amen? Amen. This is what the Word of God says. Now there was a certain man from Ramtham, Sophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, and son of Jehoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah But the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Verse 9. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorposts of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Verse 17, then Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the Lord of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. 
She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord but this boy I have prayed for this boy I have prayed and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him so I have also dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives he is dedicated to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there chapter 2 verse 1 then Hannah prayed and said my heart exalts the Lord my horn is exalted in the Lord my mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation there is no one holy like the Lord Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more, so very proud. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. He keeps their feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. pray that you would speak to us now. God, I pray that you would use my voice, that you would use my actions, that you would use my mind, that you would use everything within me to communicate your word. May your spirit have his way and his will, Lord, as he communicates to his people And as he opens the minds and the hearts of unbelievers, I pray if there's someone here today who does not know you as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. I know that was long, but I believe it was necessary. Too many times we hear sermons with just short excerpts and just one phrases, and God wants us to really dig and read all of his word. Amen. And we see here a beautiful story, story of the woman Hannah. And this is lessons from a godly woman. I want to give you five simple things that we can take from this story of Hannah. And the first is this, God is the author of every life. God is the author of every life. We see that very clearly in verse 5 and 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says, But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had what? Closed her womb. What is this telling us? It's simply telling us that God is the author of every single life. He is the one that creates life. In this time and culture... The time of the writing of Samuel and before, and it was considered a disgrace for a woman to be barren. And the stigma of barrenness was to the people of that day a sign of God's disapproval. Adding to Hannah's grief, we see in the text that there was a constant verbal assault from Penina. Penina was Elkanah's other wife, and the obvious thought here is, Oh my, this is polygamy, right? How many of you thought that when I was reading that? 
He has two wives at the same time. Now understand the Bible does not condone this. It's just telling us the story. It's telling us, it's relating to us what was happening. And the people of Israel and the children of Israel often disobeyed the commands of the Lord, especially this command. And yet God withheld punishment for it. Although polygamy was not God's design for mankind, it was tolerated at the time. You say, how could God tolerate such immorality and sin? Well, he tolerates your immorality and my immorality and my sin and your sin every single day. Amen? It's called grace. And so we need to be careful when we come to the word of God that we do not judge with unrighteous judgment those who have gone before us. They need grace just like we need grace. Amen? Yet we ought not miss the obvious consequences that come from disregarding the Lord's intended family structure. This is a lesson that our society needs to hear today. We ought not ignore God's commands in terms of the family and what the family structure looks like. Disobedience to God's design, listen, disobedience to God's design always brings heartache. God is putting boundaries and God has created the family and the family structure in such a way to bless you, not to hurt you. And so when we go outside of the bounds of God's design for marriage and God's design for the family, we end up hurting ourselves and bringing heartache upon our own lives. In his divine wisdom, God has designed marriage to be between one man and one woman for life. But that's a different message. Let's stay back with Hannah. Hannah is barren. She's ridiculed by the other wife. She has great grief. And it's all because she cannot give birth. She cannot conceive. It's a terrible indicator of the wickedness of our society today that we see children as problems to be removed rather than blessings to be enjoyed. The human being that has been authored and created by God is now seen by and large in our nation as a hindrance or an obstacle to what? To self-gratification and self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment. Our society now sees the child as an inconvenience which prevents one from pursuing career plans, personal freedom, and whatever brings them personal pleasure. A child in the womb is now viewed as a problem and a choice to be dealt with and ultimately to be discarded. But God's word speaks directly to this and teaches contradictory to the thinking of this world system regarding children. Psalm 127 verses 3 through 5 says this, Behold, children are a what? Gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a what, church? Reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Children are a blessing from God, John MacArthur says, not a burden or a quote-unquote lifestyle choice. The married couple who who gains a child has great cause for rejoicing, while the childless couple pour out their requests before the Lord as Hannah did. And Hannah recognized it was the Lord's responsibility to provide her with children or withhold them as he saw fit. God is the author of all life. So let me just speak clearly and plainly this morning. Abortion is not a right because God is the author of every single life in the womb. No woman, no judge, no president, nor anyone else has the right to kill the human life that God has created. Now let me tell you why you might have a problem with that if you have a problem with that. You see, what we do is we take God's word as Christians, if you are a Christian, and we place it one of two places in our lives. We either place it above us and allow it to impress upon us and move us in directions that God sees fit and we go wherever God tells us to go. We do whatever God tells us to do. We're obedient to his word regardless whether or not we believe it in in our heart of hearts, whether or not we agree with it, right? You say, "I, I can't believe you said that, whether or not you believe it. Sometimes it's hard to believe, amen? And that is what faith is because we know the character of God, because we know the nature of God. We trust God and we obey him even when we don't understand, amen? 
Even when our feelings tell us other things, even when our friends tell us other things, we allow the word of God to move us from place to place. But here's what a lot of Christians do. They don't put the word of God here. They put the word of God down here. And they move around it when it becomes inconvenient, such as this issue. Well, I believe it's a woman's choice. But that's not what Scripture says, is it? Scripture says it's God's choice. It's not any person's choice. We are human beings. We are fallible. We are sinful beings. But what we do is we do this. How many of you are disturbed by that? You should be more disturbed by your sin. We become the authority and God's feet is submitted under us when we do things contrary to him and to his word. But that's not how the Christian ought to live. This, this deserves reverence, amen? But we don't worship pages, amen? We worship the God of the pages. And in your life and in my life, whether it's abortion, whether it's any other issue, you and I must submit ourselves to the authority of the word of God. The world has gone crazy, amen? It's gone crazy. But the Christian remains sane as far as they are tied to and obedient to and submitted to the word of the living God. Because God is the author of all life. This is what we see from the godly woman Hannah. We see God is in complete control of all life. And it's a matter of where we place God, God's word in our lives. Listen, every single person is born with sin. We're born with different proclivities to different sins. But it does not give us the right to disobey the word of God. This is true for life in the womb. God is the author of all life. Secondly, God is sovereign over all life. It's not just that he is the author of all life. It is that he is sovereign over all life as well. In 1 Samuel Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says this. It says, the Lord closed her womb. That is, the Lord do it. And then verse 11, it says, O Lord of hosts. Host there is referring to God is being in control of armies. And God is in control of human armies and angel armies. And then in verse chap or chapter 2, verse 6, it says, the Lord kills and makes alive. And Job himself said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. What are we talking about? We're talking about God's sovereignty. God is in control, not just of when someone is born, not just in the creation of a human being, but over that life, listen to me, listen to me, in death. God is in control of the day you die. If God is the creator of life and author of life, then he has the right to determine when that life ends. God's sovereignty over life includes any stage of life, from conception to grave. John MacArthur said, in the same way God divinely and sovereignly causes pregnancy, he also is the one who ultimately is in control of how long people live. And Psalm 139, 16 says this, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. Listen to these three words. All my days were written in your book. And what? Planned. Before a single one of them began. Now I'm not ignorant to the fact that there are mothers in this room who have experienced the loss of their child. And to the mother who has lost a child through no fault of her own, let me say you are not responsible for the death of your child. God is. Because God is the author of all life. Therefore it is not murder for God to take a life. God in his good and sovereign wisdom chose to take the life of your child. I do not say that without emotion, without understanding, without sympathy and empathy. I say that simply as a fact of the word of God. And you can rest in that knowledge. God can handle the weight of taking your child early so you don't have to. Amen? Maybe you know someone who was in this situation, who has been in this situation. You need to speak words of comfort to them. You need to listen to them. And at the same time, rely on God and his sovereignty over all life. I'm also not ignorant to the majority of mothers in here who probably feel in some way, shape, or form a great deal of blame, a great deal of shame, a great deal of regret and remorse, maybe even sadness because their child has not walked with the Lord. Or perhaps your child has walked away from the Lord. 
Chapter 2, verse 6 says this. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. What does that mean? It means it is God who brings individuals into relationship with him and thus into everlasting life. Listen, you are responsible for teaching your children the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? But you are not responsible for their salvation. Just like we are responsible as Christians to preach the word of God, we cannot save anyone. Amen? We are called to preach the word to our home first and foremost. Husbands to wives, fathers to children, wives to husbands, mothers to daughters and sons. We are called first and foremost, your greatest, listen, your greatest responsibility as a parent. I'm not a parent, I'm just speaking the word of God. Your greatest responsibility, not just to your children, but to your grandchildren, is to tell them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a parent, though, I'm sure you have made mistakes, I'm sure you have set bad examples. Perhaps even led your children away from, from God. But, but listen closely this morning. If any of that is true, it's also true that as of this moment, that is the past. It's in the past. It's under the blood. Amen? You have a new day, a new start in Christ. And God is bigger than your past failures and sins. John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. When you're speaking the gospel to your children, your grandchildren, when you're sharing the gospel with family members, parents, listen, make sure that you understand the weight does not fall on you. The responsibility of communicating the gospel does, but the actual salvation of your children falls on God alone. It is their decision as God prompts them from the word of God, just like you had the decision to trust in Christ as well. Amen? And so that leaves us where? It leaves us where Hannah is. What is the greatest thing you can do for your child? Speak the gospel to them? Teach them the word of God? Yes. But the greatest thing that you can do for your child, listen to me closely, is pray for them. Pray like their life depends on it. Pray like their eternal life depends on it. Your grandchildren that you have never told the gospel need to hear the gospel. And it starts with you having a burden for them in prayer, in private, crying out to God, save them, save them, save them. How terrible to give your kids all the gifts, all the spoils of this life. How terrible to give all your grandchildren everything they've ever wanted. And you're the grandparent that they love because they give them a $10 bill every time you see them or whatever it is. And miss eternal life for them. How sad. Amen? As believing parents, your greatest responsibility is to point them to Christ. First in salvation and then in sanctification. And you have a beautiful opportunity. If you have a, 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 a sordid past, who doesn't? Amen. If you have some things you've done in front of your children that you're embarrassed about, and who hasn't? Then the gospel will shine all the brighter. Because we fall on the grace of God through his son Jesus Christ. Amen. And we lift up our children and our grandchildren in prayer. The greatest thing you can do for your child now is pray for them in faith, just like Hannah did before her child was ever even born or conceived. A parent's greatest prayer is not simply for a child, but also for a child that loves and serves the Lord. So it's not just praying for their salvation, it's praying for their dedication. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, it says, She, speaking of Hannah, made a vow... And said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. In verse 27 and 28 of the same chapter, it says, Hannah says, For this boy, after the child has been born, for this boy I have prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. So I have also, here's the word, dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. In the beginning of June, we're going to have a dedication ceremony for children. What does that mean? It's really just 
an opportunity to express as parents your desire and your intention to raise your child in the admonition and the word of God. It's, it's an opportunity to tell the world, I want this child to love the Lord and to serve the Lord, and that should be the prayer of every parent. Amen? That doesn't stop after they leave the house. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray as Hannah prayed with passion and sincerity. Never stop praying for your children. Thirdly, God gives life through prayer. God gives life through prayer. Let me ask you a question. Did Hannah have any, and I emphasize the word any, did Hannah have any control over her barrenness? <laughs> Zero. She had no control over her barrenness. Now, in her moment of crisis, she didn't buy the latest miracle drug. We're not told she did anything like that. She didn't go see the doctor. She didn't go see the fertility doctor, did she? She didn't Google how to increase fertility or have one of her crazy aunts make her a fertility blanket. <laughs> she turned to the Lord in prayer first. There's nothing wrong with those other things. They're not sinful. She looked for answers in the only real place they could be found. You see, we're, we're so quick, aren't we, to go to other sources in our time of desperation, in our time of need, when we need something from the Lord, we are so quick to try to figure it out for ourselves, to ask the friend that we know, or the friend of the friend, or get a connection, or fix it, right? Hannah was beyond all that. This was completely out of her hands. She had tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. And she finally realized it's all dependent on the Lord. 1 Samuel 1, 8 through 11, it says this, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Man, does that not peg a husband, right? Does that not sound like a husband that does, doesn't have a clue? This, this guy says to his wife, why are you sad? Like, do you know your wife at all? Do you know what's going on, right? He probably married Hannah first, and then because she couldn't have children, he married Penina. And Penina has children for him, and no doubt he knows the conflict that is happening in that relationship. And he says to her, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart sad? How many husbands have said that to their wives? <laughs> what is wrong, right? Nothing. And then he says that foolish statement, am I not better to you than ten sons? Man, if I said that to my wife, I'd probably get smacked. In verse 11, we see that Hannah makes a vow. And some have interpreted this as Hannah bargaining with the Lord, but this is not the case because ultimately Hannah gave back to God that which she asked for in full surrender and submission to the Lord. Think about this for a moment. Hannah desired a child. She desired it with all her heart. She desired a baby. She wanted that so very deeply, so very passionately. She wept for this child. She prayed for this child probably over a long period of time. But at the end of the day, what does she say? She said, I'm going to give them back to you, Lord. Now, my wife and I don't have children. We're praying for children. We want children. The Lord has not blessed us with children. But we know... We know what Hannah's feeling. We know Hannah's prayers. We know Hannah's emotions. We finally come to a place, just in all transparency and honesty, where we've said over the last couple of years, not our wills, but your will be done. And if you do give us a child, they will be dedicated to the Lord. And we desire for God to use, whether that's through adoption or through natural pregnancy, to, to, to use this child to glorify God, to bring glory to God, to give honor and serve the Lord all the days of his life, just like Hannah did. Here's the difference. We don't have to let that child go after three years. Hannah, in making this dedication, knew that she would be with this child two to three years, as long as it took to wean the child, to breastfeed the child. Then when the child was done being weaned, she would give that child to the temple to serve. 
forever, the Bible says. Think about that heart wrench. That, to some people, would be worse than never having a child at all. You love that child. You raise that child. You wean that child. And then you give that child back to the Lord and very rarely ever speak or see the child again. This was Hannah's heart. And we see Hannah's heart in her prayer. And I want to give you five simple things that Hannah did and five aspects of Hannah's prayer that can benefit you in your prayer life and in your spiritual life. First is adoration. This is how she prayed. She adored the Lord. She praised the Lord. She worshiped the Lord. In verse 11b, it says, she said this phrase. It's the first time this phrase is used in the Bible. O Lord of hosts. I mentioned earlier that Lord of hosts means, host means the angel armies. It means human armies. Or it could mean, listen to me, it could mean the galaxies. Not just the stars, not just the sun and moon, but the galaxy. And what is happening here is in Hannah's prayer, she's coming to God, barren, an impossible situation that she has absolutely no control over. And she's looking at her great God and she's adoring him and praising him and recognizing him for who he is. And she comes to God and she praises him for being the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all the galaxies. Basically, she's saying, Lord, if you can do that... You can do this. And that is the attitude that we are to have in prayer. When you come to God in prayer, start with adoration. Start with worship. Look at the word of God. Pray the word of God. Pray the character of God. Pray the attributes of God. Know who God is and come to him and declare it back to him. Why? Not for God's sake, but for your heart. God, you can take care of this cancer. God, you can take care of this infertility. God, you can take care of this situation. God, you are the God of the galaxies. You're the God of all armies. You're the God of all angels. God, you are in control. Amen? Amen. Adoration, secondly, was honesty. Hannah was absolutely honest with the Lord. In verse 8, it says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart, and it says the word sad, but the real translation, a better translation is, is angry. There is some anger here. Listen, not all anger is, is ungodly. Not all anger is sin. We saw Jesus get angry. He did not sin. In verse 10, it says, she, she greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and what? And wept bitterly. In verse 11, the latter part, it says, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord. And all the days of life, a razor will not, will, shall never come on his head. She's, she's anguishing in the Lord, asking God for what he would give to her. In verse 15, it says, but Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I am a woman, what? Oppressed in spirit. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you are oppressed in spirit? That means downcast, distressed, discouraged, depressed. She says, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. It's okay to be honest before the Lord. You know, I came across, I came across a social media page. I think it was called Cussing Christians. That's all it was. It was Christians who cuss. <laughs> you can laugh. It's all right. It's kind of funny. Now, 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 I'm not talking about like every once in a while. These were, these were quote-unquote Christians who were just like okay with cussing. They cuss in their prayers. That is not to be the attitude of the believer, amen? amen? We are to be sanctified. We are to be respectful and reverent when we come to the Lord. But at the same time, God doesn't expect these and thous and all those types of flowery language. He wants you to be honest in your prayer. He wants you to pour out your soul as Hannah did. That's what it says. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. How can we not be honest with the Lord? He knows it all anyways. Amen? So whether it's not meeting that person yet in your life that you want to be married, and whether it's having a child, whether it's a job situation, whether it's illness in your life, man, you can be honest with God. We have a God that wants you to be honest. Adoration, honesty, the third one is humility. Humility. Just to be clear, I'm not advocating you cuss in your prayers or otherwise, okay? Just to be really clear about that. 
humility. Three times in verse, I believe, 11, it says maidservant, maidservant, maidservant. And then two more times later in the passage, she uses the word maidservant with Eli the priest. This is meaning just what it sounds like. I am a woman who is a servant of the Lord. In verse 11, C, she says this, if, listen to me, if you will. That should be a phrase you use in every prayer. God, if you will. What is that? That's automatic surrender to the will of God. That's automatic submission to what God wants more than what you want. It's an attitude, a heart of humility. Hannah has adoration and praise for God. She's honest before God in her prayer. And then she has a humble and servant heart. Fourthly is asking. She says, but we'll give your maidservant a son. She straight up asks the Lord for what she wants. Some of us, we pray to God, we get all flower, we say all these things, but we never just come out and ask the Lord what we want. But James 4, 2 through 3 is on the screen and says this, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, why? Because you do not ask God. And then he says, the reason behind all of it is when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. What is James saying? He's saying in prayer, when you pray, what's happening is your heart's not right. You're asking God for things, but you're asking with the wrong motive. You're asking for your own pleasure, your own self-gratification, your own will. Now, is it bad to want things? No, God has put natural desires within us. But those natural desires and those requests, listen, have to be submitted to God in prayer. This was the attitude of Hannah. And she asked the Lord for a son. God may not be answering your prayers because you're asking with the wrong motives. Is it for you or is it for the glory of the Lord? That is the, that is the, the strainer as you will. Of all prayer requests. I mean, what do you mean? I mean, when I was growing up with oranges, we would sque- squeeze those oranges in strainers and get out all that nasty pulp, right? Amen? How many of you like pulp? How many of you dislike pulp? All right. And you squeeze that out and you strain it in your prayer life. You need to have this mindset. You need to have this strainer. Am I praying this for the glory of the Lord or is it for my own selfish desires? That will weed out selfish desires. Prayers. That will weed out prayers that have the wrong motive. Lastly is attitude. So she's adoring the Lord. That's adoration. She's honest with the Lord. She's humble before the Lord. She asks the Lord her request, but her attitude is right. In verse 11, the latter part, it says, Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. See, we have confidence that when we pray to God in this manner, he will always answer our request. But Hannah's attitude, her heart is right before the Lord. And we know that because she says, I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor will come upon his head. What is that talking about? It's talking about the Nazarite vow. Usually this vow lasted weeks or months. But often it would include the entire life. Hannah gives this child to the Lord. Dedicates this child to the Lord for his entire life. God answers prayers, amen? Verse 19, then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Verse 20, it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. The the, the name Samuel literally means heard from God. That's awesome, right? God heard. God heard her prayer and answered her prayer. Why? Not because of anything Hannah did, but because of God's good grace to her. John 16, 23 through 24. In that day, Jesus said, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything, now listen, in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing. Here's that phrase again. In my name, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. What do you want this morning? What have you been praying to God about lately? What are you calling on God in your prayers to do? You need to make sure that your motives are, motives are right, that it's for the glory of the, of the Lord, and, and making sure that it's in his name, that is according to his character. God will not answer anything that is contrary to his character. Amen? Samuel was 
God's direct answer to Hannah's prayer. Does this mean that God will answer every single prayer that we have? Yes. Yes. Maybe not in the way that you want, but he'll answer it. Amen? We've all heard it before. God answers by either saying yes, no, or wait. Some of y'all are waiting, and you've been waiting for a long time. God is faithful, and he will answer your prayers according to his faithful character. One thing that's not in your notes that I would have added had I had time. These five things, I would have added another one, or at least gone back to number one. At the end of your prayer, you should go back to adoration. After, listen to me, after God answers your prayer for good grief, thank him. Just thank him. Take time to adore him again. After he comes to you and answers your prayer, thank him. When he answers, we ought to praise him again. Makes me think of a hymn. I liked it so much this morning, I wrote it down. All praise to him who names the stars that sing his fame in skies afar. All praise to him who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, yet bends to hear our every prayer with sovereign power and tender care. That last line. In prayer, remember that God is sovereign. He is in control. Amen? Amen. And at the same time, he bends down to us and cares for us deeply. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we pray to. This is the God that Hannah prayed to. Fourthly, God uses the weak things of this life for his glory. God uses the weak things of this life for his glory. As you read through the scriptures, you will begin to see a theme emerge. God always uses the humble. He always uses those who know that they do not deserve, listen to me, anything from God. That's who God uses. He does so to reveal his surpassing strength and glory. This is why God resists the proud. Because in the proud mind, in the proud heart, in the proud person's actions, they receive the glory. In God's view of things, we give him praise and him glory, listen to me, when we are weak. Talk about turning the world upside down. That's not of the world, amen? That is Christian to its core. Christ calls us, listen to me, to embrace our weakness. Not to pat ourselves on the back, not to say, I'm the best, I can do this, I am no, 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 no. We recognize our frailty, our humanness, our sinfulness, and in our humility and acknowledgement of who we really are at the heart of hearts, who you really are in your heart of hearts, and who I am in my heart of hearts is a wretched sinner. Amen? Amen. It's only then that God can save me. <laughs> it's only then that God can use me. In my weakness... Paul said, in my weakness, I'm strong. Why? Because God is shown through the weak. God's strength pours through those who are humble and weak and recognize their depravity and their brokenness and their sinfulness. This is seen throughout the scriptures. Abraham and Sarah, what was their weakness? Not just that they were sinners, but what was their weakness, church? They were old. <laughs> and all the old people said, amen. Amen. I'm getting there too, don't worry, I'm catching up. We all are, right? We're all getting older. And yet, God used them to produce a nation revealing with God all things are truly possible. The Israelite people were a weak people. They were small and feeble compared to the surrounding neighbors. And God used them to reveal his grace, not just to them, but to all people. And in Hannah's case here, he uses a grief-stricken Weeping, broken, desperate, despondent almost woman who has all but given up and just fell at God's feet. That's the person that God uses. 
And God will do everything in his power to get you to that point. And some of you have gone through such pain and such suffering in this life. And if that is you, listen, I can empathize, I can sympathize. We all have gone through struggles, some worse than others, some suffering worse than others. But here's the good news. God has allowed that to happen for his glory. He will use your weakness. He will use your suffering. He will use your pain. And he will get goodness out of it he will get glory out of it and he will listen he will give you a joy that surpasses any pain any suffering and people from the outside will look at you and say I don't understand how they're going through that I don't understand how they have peace and joy in the midst of that man we exist for God's glory amen church and when we encounter battles when we encounter suffering we can either just get through it like everybody else in the world or we can submit to the Lord and say when I am weak then I am strong because I am in you God I'm resting in you and your sovereignty and your plan Hannah's use of God's use of Hannah was a proof of his strength it was a proof of his providence and sovereignty over all things 1 Samuel 2 verse 7 and 8 This is what Hannah says. All chapter 2 is about, listen, it's about the justice of God. That God is a just judge. Verse 7, the Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust, he lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he set the world on them. God is in control of all things. He's fair, he's just, he's balanced. But ultimately, God will not come to the aid of those who do not recognize and acknowledge their need. James tells us, and I know you know this, God resists the proud but gives what? Grace to the humble. And God still works in this manner today. 1 Corinthians 1.27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Let me ask you, are you in a weak place this morning? If you've lived any amount of time, you've experienced weakness. Are you in a weak place this morning? Are you heavily burdened? If you are, you're in a good place for God to use you. Are you distressed, despised? Are you depressed? If you are, you're in a good place for God to use you. Are you humiliated, humbled? Are you hungry? God is putting you in these positions so that he can use you and show his strength in your weakness. Have you been ridiculed and rejected? You're in a good place for God to use you. Do you feel the weight of your sin? Do you feel the weight of your sin? The Christian should feel the weight of their sin every single day. And yet understand and recognize that there's grace and mercy and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And God uses and will use that weakness and that heart attitude to bring glory to himself in your life. See, the devil wants to, the enemy wants to take your pain and take your suffering, take your weakness and take your sin. And he wants to beat you down more with it and beat you over the head with it and tell you you're not worthy. Amen? That's what the devil wants. That's what the devil says. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can respond with, you're right. But I know someone who is worthy. And I'm in him. And because of his blood and because of his forgiveness, I've been forgiven. And in that, listen to me, church, in that is strength. It's strength. It shows the strength of our God. That he can override our sin, override our failures, and override the accusations of the enemy. Some of y'all, just like me, man, it don't stop in your head. You'll never be good enough. You'll never conquer the sin. You'll never get your life together. You'll never raise those kids. You'll never do that. You'll never do that. And God is saying to you and to me this morning, you'll never do it in your own strength. Cling to your weakness. Embrace your weakness. Say, yeah, that's who I am, but now I'm a new person in Christ, and God will show up and show off in your life. That's what he wants to do. But it starts with understanding and acknowledging your weakness. To those who come to God with empty hands, acknowledging their own weakness, God fills those open hands, listen, with extravagant and magnificent grace. God could have used any Israelite woman to bring Samuel into the world, but he chose Hannah. Why? Because God uses those who embrace their weakness 
and are desperately dependent on him. Are you desperate for God? I get a little weary. I, I know where, where I am spiritually. And, and, I, and I'll be honest, I, I think I can know to some degree where other people are spiritually in terms of their worship to the Lord. I'm not talking about how lo- loud they sing. I'm talking about if they want to sing. <laughs> I'm talking about if they want to worship. Because if you want to sing praises to God, then that means you understand what God has done for you. Amen? And when we come in worship, we come with empty hands. We start a lot of our our Sunday morning services out with the recognition that we are sinners. In our prayers, we talk about how we're sinful, how, how we don't deserve mercy and love and all those things. Other places, sometimes you go there and, and they're like, God loves you. The first thing you hear when you walk in the door, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Yes, that's true, amen. God loves every single person. There is a general love of God. But you also must recognize that God is just and holy and his wrath abides on those who are not in Christ. God draws near to the brokenhearted, to the humble, to the people who are weak, but not just weak, people that recognize their weakness and listen, listen, are dependent on God. How dependent on God are you? Lastly, as we close, God judges every life justly. God judges every single life and he does so with justice. God is just over all things. Hannah got pregnant, right? My wife is not. Listen to me. God is still just. He's just. What does that mean? It means he's righteous. What does that mean? It means he's right. What does that mean? It means he's good. What does that mean? It means that every decision he makes in regards to the things and circumstances and situations of your life as a believer and my life as a believer and my wife's life as a believer, it's good. And I can rest in his goodness. This is our God. He is just over all things. And he is just also over all, listen to me, he's just over all people. He is a just judge over all people. He judges every life justly. Now let me ask you this morning, we're about to close, listen to me closely. God judges every life justly. Amen? Now is that a good thing or a bad thing? It depends. It depends. Ultimately, it's a good thing because we can count on God being just. He will always be just. But that's not good if you don't know God. Because the justice of God will be poured out on you. The wrath of God, because he is just, will be poured out on you. That's not good. That's bad. Amen? Amen? It all depends on whether you have, you have if, if you, not your family, not your father, not your parents, not, not anybody else, if you have recognized your need for a Savior. If you've recognized your dependence, listen, on God for salvation. And Hannah's story, Hannah's account, this is a real account, it points to Christ. Her words And her life story both point to Jesus Christ. Her words point to Christ in verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. I promise we're about to close. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. Now listen. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And he will give strength to his king and will will exalt the horn of his anointed. What is she talking about? Hannah thinks she's talking about the future king that's coming. She's talking about the future king ultimately who is Jesus Christ. The king of kings and lord of lords. She's pointing us to Christ in her life and in her words. And she's telling us that, listen, listen, in this life or the next, God will judge justly. Justice will be served to every single person, either in their own actions and being condemned to hell for all of eternity for their sin, or on the cross of Christ as Christ paid for their sin and they trust in him. There's no other way. There's no other way. Justice will be served in the person of Jesus Christ. Acts 17, 30 and 31, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to what church? To repent, repent, 
Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness. How? By a man he is appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Who has been raised from the dead? But Jesus Christ. God will use Christ to judge every single person. But the good news is salvation has come in Christ too. It's not just that Christ will judge and judge justly. It's that he extends mercy, listen, to those who are like Hannah. And recognize their need. And acknowledge their dependence. Listen, not for a son, but for a savior. Not for a son, but for salvation. Listen, this is the gospel. The Hannah story is a microcosm of the gospel. Shouting to you this morning, be saved. Trust in Christ. Believe in him. Tell God you are unworthy. You cannot save yourself. All your righteous deeds are like filthy rags and you come to him like Hannah prayed. God, I'm dependent on you. I'm counting on you. I can't do it enough of myself. I'm trusting in your provision. And God has provided a son for you just like he provided Hannah a son. But this son was perfect. This son was God in the flesh. This son paid the ultimate price for your salvation. And Samuel, and the birth of Samuel, Samuel's whole role, Samuel's whole job, whole job was to anoint the kings and listen, and point to the Savior to come. To point to Jesus Christ. Just like he did for Hannah, God in his grace has provided a son for us. God has provided a son for us. God has provided salvation for us. What's the application this morning? Well, first, it's to unbelievers. Salvation through Christ is the only way to God. Period. There is no other way. Amen? You have to depend on God's provision. And he has provided Jesus Christ as the way to eternal life. So be saved. Be saved. I don't ever want to be unclear about that. Be saved. You say, how do I do that? By trusting and putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's completely his work. Just as it was his work to give Hannah a son. Something Hannah could not do. Something Hannah could not produce. God has produced salvation for you. And he's done it through the person of Jesus Christ. Trust in him. And to believers, let me ask you this question. Are you depending on God? Are you depending on God? Now here's where the rubber meets the road with that. You say, how, how do I know if I'm depending on God? Let me ask you this. Are you ready? Say amen. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? You want to know if you're dependent on God? How's your prayer life? Is it passionate? Is it cold? How's your prayer life? I mean your real prayer life. Not I get up in the morning and I say prayer while I'm brushing my teeth. I'm talking about passionate Hannah type prayer. Right? Like you really need God. Like you depend on him. Listen, not just for salvation, but to walk out the door of your house and make it through another day. Amen? That's how you know if you're dependent on God. How's your prayer life? Father, we thank you.